Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of A or the or A Triathlon Podcast. Call cool Talking Triathlon. You guessed it. We the talk triathlon about tri- the 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 podcast that kind of talks about triathlon <laughs> sometimes and goes off on weird tangents. Uh, like this intro. My name is Tim Ford, and I'm joined by James Belgimbo, mate. Welcome back. You took a week off last week. Lucky you. Uh, you were off gall- gallivanting around uh, where Banyoles or something, or no, uh, Bay Bay yeah, Bay Bay somewhere. Bay somewhere. Somewhere near the near the Alps. Very nice. Uh, how's things, mate? What's going on? Yeah, not too bad. Not too bad. I enjoy. I listened. I listened to the the podcast you did in my absence, and I think uh, Young Max did a very good job. He's gone places. Was, that guy. Uh, it was a good stand-in performance. Um, needs to work on his vocal quality a little bit. You know, get some depth going on there. But other than that, you boys did all right. Yeah, it was good. It's always How good are you to doing? Thanks. Yeah, good mate. Good. Uh, ticket ticking along. Um, I think back to running. Did some fast intervals this week. Actually, I wanted to see how the foot held up. Held up good. So things are things are looking good. I, I That's went back. good news. That's good yeah. news. You and your foot have been worrying me like sometimes yeah. a little bit. <laughs> no, I think it's things are looking good, mate. I um, yeah, I decided to do yeah a bit of speed work the other day, and, and it held up pretty good. And it's funny. Um. Who would have thought the biggest, I mean, apart from like the, the rehab and everything, but actually running more seems to have been the thing that's sort of the foot out. I, you know, I think you get a little bit like nervous when you have an injury or you need to like not run too much. And I've sort of convinced myself of this idea of I should never run two days in a row. And for the last month, I've been doing back-to-back run days and my foot's never been better. So it's, uh, yeah, it's good. I'm really optimistic about get it. Get that so blood pumping in it, mate. Yeah. That's so that's key. That's good, but you know it was good to chat with uh, with Max last week. Um, yeah, it was a slightly short episode, but I think it was okay. I had to end up doing a little bit myself, which is solo podcasting is uh, it's a it's a bizarre experience to be honest. Um, yeah, but how about you, mate? Yeah, what, uh, I don't really know. I don't really know how these sort of YouTubers who monologue stuff do it. Do you know what I mean? It doesn't it doesn't sit with me. But yeah, um, I'm not too bad. I'm I'm starting to ramp up my training a little bit as well. Going up through the gears, putting things in place. You've got a race to announce. Yeah, yeah. Going to be doing the uh, T100 London. So uh, registered and signed up for that, mate. Uh, an invitation. An invitation that I've accepted. And um, I've actually spent this afternoon after I put my laptop away and before we started recording here, dusting off all my old kit, <laughs> establishing what I haven't, haven't got in my training room, understanding no. what I need to get and um, arranging a bike. Well, I'm assuming that the World Triathlon Championship Series World Champion from 2021, Christian Blumenfeld, uh, has helped to get you a bike because, or at least some, you know, we, he, we know that he's going to hook you up. Again, World Triathlon Championship Series World Champion 2021. <laughs> <laughs> what was that Christian series he won? Blumenfeld, the World Triathlon <laughs> Championship Series World Title in 2021. The only thing of note that he did that year. <laughs> yeah, the only thing he's ever done of note, isn't it, that one? <laughs> Oh, sorry. He also won the Olympic gold medal. He's also won the Ironman World Championships. He's also won seventy point three World Championships, and um, PTO. No, uh, one. Christian. Christian has sent me a series of messages over the last few weeks. But normally, taking the piss out of things we've said or sending strange pictures of himself doing various things. Uh, but I haven't obtained a bike for race weekend yet. What I have done is called in a, a favor, a very old. A very old uh, racing bike to start doing some winter miles on to get my, to get my legs moving and rehab my hip. I still remember you had that you had uh, Hayden's old um, specialized shoe that that sexy sexy bike and what you probably rode it like five times the entire time you had it or something. Yeah, and if I'm honest, when I got rid of those bikes a couple of years ago, I was convinced I would I would never regret that decision. I was done with racing. I was just going to run ultras for the rest of my life and maybe buy a gravel bike in the future for some for some bike touring or something. But right now, <laughs> I'm so gutted I sold those bikes. And I swear somebody, I don't know who it could have been, was like, are you sure about this, mate? Like, you know, time, things Yeah, like yeah, <laughs> yeah. And I was like, no, no, I'm done. I've, made, I've drawn a line. It's over. And now I'm all enthusiastic again and trawling bike websites and wondering which shiny time trial bike I should own. I think I'm going to head over and do that T100 race as well, looking at the time in, because um, I'm going to go to Paris for the Olympics. Uh, I think it's the weekend before the triathlon. So I think the idea is I'll fly to London, do that T100 race with you, uh, and then duck down to Paris, duck take the Eurostar over to Paris for some Olympic games. And so basically, you've you've got you've got me on my on my 
2011 carbon yet very basic road bike and you on your high tech treks and all the new gear and the best and turbo again it's like and... it's, it's like rocky four mate i'm going to be out in the wilderness you know training training in the wilds of devon well, what and you're going to be time... in a high tech lab the last time we raced i beat you by what 53 minutes so let's see if i can crack the hour this time <laughs> 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 no, nah, it's been a long time since I've been fast, mate. There's plenty of room to improve. But uh, if there's other things you'd like to improve, like the, your listening experience and you want to get a bit more of a raw, unfiltered version of this podcast, head to patreon.com forward slash talking triathlon. $5 a month gets you access to our bonus monthly show, which we are recording immediately after this one today. Uh, there's a sw- number of other ones. We have to delete one, but there's a number of other episodes. Right, we'll probably talk about why we deleted that one on this week's bonus show. Uh, this one's bonus show. Patreon group, uh, yeah, sorry, Facebook group, WhatsApp group, all that good stuff. As we come to race season, uh, it is the time to get in there. I actually woke up to like 25 messages discussing the PTO wildcards this morning, which is always puts a bit of a smile on my face. But we are here to talk about everything that has happened since we caught up last. And the good news is, Jimbo, there has been plenty. I thought a good place to start because it's something that I touched on with Max last week, uh, or probably a bit more after uh, Max, was about Super Truck. The announcement, the Super League Triathlon has rebranded. They've moved away from the Super League Triathlon brand and they've moved towards Super Tri. Uh, I guess it's just a brand refresh. It's something we see happen most brands except for we've seen uh, PTO turn into T100. We've seen Super League turn into Super Tri. Iron Man remained Iron Man. Uh, We know that there's going to be a a, a different sort of series this year. We know that some of the race venues are changing. We know about the bullshit drama with um, Malibu, which is... Uh, the, we saw that article come out this week where Sam Renouf was saying that the reason the PTO decided to support the race was because they want access to the celebrities, which I, th- I found interesting. Uh, but yeah. the uh, the thing that kind of, and I, I touched on this in the last week's episode, was the the fact that we've been quite vocal about liking the fact that Super League or Super Try has always been about the pro experience. Now they're like, no, we're focusing on mass participation events too. And I feel like it's, history repeating itself a little bit. We're going through that same thing when the PTO announced age group race and you're like, okay, this ain't, this ain't working. Uh, but I don't know. What do you, what do you, what do you think about the super try, mate? Yeah. I mean, it's, it was quite timely, wasn't it? Because we, we, we just had that conversation on the podcast, you and I yep. about how we loved super league for the way they nurtured and, and looked after the pro racing experience at the expense of all else really. And the age group was, it kind they kind of, dabbled in it to begin with very slightly and then you've got now i think up until they announced made this announcement you've got the um you still got the corporate relay that they do but there isn't really an age group option with the super league races and they sometimes do some um some stuff for content collection or to help local children do a small race or something like that but um yeah so the rebrand i quite like the rebrand not gonna lie I think a brand refresh is never a bad thing when you when you've been doing something for a certain amount of time, you know you've got you've got an, an audience that follows you. Why not reset and and shake things up a bit? I quite like the new logo. It's quite simple and catchy. I quite like the new website. I'm on it right now, having a poke around. But yeah, the the focus on age group racing is interesting. Um, I would assume from the outside looking in, and then we'll get your opinion from a little bit more inside looking out in a second but i would assume it's it's all about trying to raise some extra income for them because you're going to get you're going to make more money you know fair not easily I'm not saying organizing races is easy but if you're putting on an age group race it's uh, it's quicker access to ready cash i mean we've seen that uh, super league has purchased a number of races the last couple of years <laughs> the malibu triathlon probably the worst example of it but the new york triathlon the chicago triathlon a big push into america i suppose and the, the I suppose, again, looking at it, you can initially go, oh, no, they're doing the same thing. I don't actually think that's what's happening here in the sense that I feel like one of the ideas we've discussed a lot on this show, mostly in relation to the PTO, has been about, yeah, piggyback on existing amateur races, but don't just have your pros do the same event, like have a different thing for the professionals. And if you look at what they've done in Malibu, for example, where the Malibu Triathlon, this you know, iconic race happens, Super League's racing on a completely different course, right? So I don't hate that idea. I I, I like the idea that if you've got all these people uh, present at an event, why not try to capitalize on it by putting on what is in effect an exhibition of the sport that you know most people that we know that most people are fans of triathlon do the sport. 
people who are there maybe have finished their race and they've got that buzz that they may be like, oh, actually, this is really cool. I want to watch it. Uh, so I actually don't hate it from that point, but it does always just make me like ring those alarm bells going, oh no, <laughs> if they, like, we've always said that the amateur revenue is like that low hanging fruit a little bit. And it does make you go, okay, is this a shift in uh, strategy out of necessity or is it genuinely an opportunity? Like that's the, that's the, the question that I always ask, but I mean, we're going to get to they it. They could do it so well though. They could do it so well, couldn't they? Because they've got these really condensed environments where the pros race in. It's not, they're not fucking off for, for hours yeah. into the distance. So you could do it so well. If you have the amateurs, the age groupers racing the day before, the morning before, give them time to get themselves sorted after the race. And then, then those people are creating that atmosphere around the pro racing where they've, you've almost got a, 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 a shake and bake crowd, haven't you? You know? Yeah, yeah exactly. And you've, an, an auto crowd ready for you to watch those pros, pros do their racing. And I, and I trust super league super try as it is now to do it well, because we've seen over and over again that they do produce really high quality racing. The pros sing their praises in terms of the race experience that they have there. Every time I listen to a pro athlete being interviewed about what they enjoy and where, which parts of the season they really enjoy. If they're an athlete that races super league, then they are always full of of how awesome they're treated, how well they're treated, how well they're looked after, the experience they get where they really feel like a professional as opposed to some of the other races throughout the year where they're just sort of turning up, going through the motions, hanging around with their federations and not really mixing with other athletes. Yeah. I know that we're going to touch on this on another thing we're going to discuss this week, but I think I've become recently, and I don't know what the epiphany moment I had is, uh, and I know I've discussed this with you both offline and online, but this idea that we've forgotten that people watch sport as a spectacle. Like it's not just about it's not just about the actual event. It's also about the everything that happens around it. Like looking at Super Bowl happened recently, okay, for example, and you've got Usher doing the halftime show. Like that's because like they they're trying to create this this event, this thing. You want to be there, right? You want to be there at the thing. And and I feel like Maybe this is an opportunity if if Super League Super Try is going, okay, well, we're gonna have this engaged audience there. We need to do more to engage them and to activate them at the events. Because I mean, we can probably transition over to that next article now. I, I don't, you know, yep, super try, cool, excellent. I just hope they keep yeah. being awesome. Uh, I think I think I think both of us over the years have had before we transition, just there have been enough times, I think, where we've learned our lesson, where we've they've done something or changed something, then we've gone, ooh, not sure. Mm. And it's worked out and looked good. That I think I'm I'm more than willing to give them the benefit of the They've doubt early it. on on these ones. Yeah, They've earned they that really right, have, I think. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's the, the the so let's move over to the next one, which was a, the article. I think I saw it this morning or yesterday. Um, tried twenty four seven put up and it was with Frederick Funk, who was talking about not really expecting much atmosphere or uh, you know met crowds at these T one hundred races, and it's sort of the thing I'm talking about, right? Where, I mean, I'll be honest, I watched that Milwaukee race last year. I thought the crowds looked. Okay, mm. like there was parts where it looked like, yeah, yeah. you know, far from you know, the the Tour de France line in the streets or Challenge Roth or, or things like that. But um, I think that there needs to be more of a focus on creating an atmosphere at the events. I think that yeah, yeah. there's been so much focus on the race, right? Where I, again, I, you watch F1 and I always I always use the analogy of F1. I was watching uh, Drive to Survive's back. I've been watching the latest season of Drive to Survive. And Half of it's about the crowds that are there. Like the athletes are walking through those people want their autographs, signatures, the things aligned. You see the people screaming as the cars go past. Like there's there's just this, it's an event, right? It's an event yeah. to be there. And I and I feel like this is the part of the of the race that it's always just been like, oh well, they're right, they're there, they're, they're their race. They might hang around, doesn't really matter. That to me is the thing that really needs to become an area of focus for the sport. I, I feel like it's it's this. Yeah, like I said, I've had this epiphany where it's like people watch on the TV because they'd rather be there, but they can't be there. We don't do that. Try off and watch it on TV because it's better to watch it on TV because if you're there in person, it's like they go past, okay, I'll see them in three hours, four hours or whatever, and then two times on a yeah. run. I feel a bit sorry for Frederick in this in this article because what he said is a bit more than the headline of pro athlete shits on atmosphere conditions. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, 
because he said, from my experience of the PTO races, I don't actually have too high expectations of the crowd for the races, especially looking at the locations. I think apart from London, possibly Ibiza, the crowd at the races will be a little bit boring, but I hope in the future this can change. However, I think London, with the race in the middle of the city, should be really cool. And that's why it's one of the races I'm looking forward to racing most. So I think what he's saying is, you know, it's a new series. Triathlon hasn't got a history of a huge amount of crowds. But in the future, this can change as things start to take off and grow around these races. So, um, so yeah, I think I think the tagline, I mean, the article I'm reading, the tagline was top 100 talent has low expectations for triathlon world tour atmosphere despite iconic locations, which does sound a bit like he's just saying the T100 is going to suck atmosphere wise from here until eternity. But in reality, he's saying, you know, initially you might have a bit of a tr problem generating that atmosphere but as things go on and go forward he's expecting that to change well i can only speak to the things i've seen on tv and the things that i've been at which is that i think singapore would be good i feel like again it's when you've got a you know a 10 plus kilometer bike loop you aren't going to have it lined especially especially this the, what's probably worth noting is that singapore course while an incredible course to race on there's no room that you can't there's nowhere to spectate on that 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 bike course because it's major roads, bridges with no shoulder. Like you couldn't you couldn't line it. it it's literally there's nowhere for spectators on the on the bike course. The run course, however, uh, which goes around the Marina Bay, uh, I think was there was heaps of people and not just obviously yeah. not just all fans, but there was a lot of people around which I actually really really liked. Uh, and as long I, as you create a zone where they can be, where you can condense those, however many fans you've got, if you've got parts of the course where they can be at, which hasn't isn't just watching the race, but generates crowds by having, you know, food, music, drinks, drinks, entertainment, music, yeah. yeah, all that stuff, all that stuff that makes people draw there. And then they're having a few beers as the crowd go by, the atmosphere builds, they're eating some some chips and mayonnaise or whatever, wherever yes. they are in the world. Yes. That sounds good. That sounds good. No, I, I again, I, I agree. I think that I, again, I, I, I look at the PTO's first year where that Dallas race is the grimmest thing I've ever seen in my life, but they didn't go back. Right. It's not like, I, again, it's to think that these guys are just like, no, 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 la, 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 la. We don't want to hear you. It's not true. They clearly listen. They pay attention. Mm. They're trying to implement things that, that, I mean, all races are with that, that neon race in Abu Dhabi for a neon race. The neon race in Saudi Arabia uh, for Super Try, not exactly a packed course. <laughs> no, no, no. Tumbleweeds and going look, past. And... They're probably not entirely focused on that. Their, their main focus is going to be the broadcast and getting an audience from the broadcast. Yes, having an atmosphere on the ground, brilliant. And eventually that will come. But their their priority has to be the broadcast because if they get that right, that's where the advertising dollars come from. It doesn't come from having loads of people packed around the year. Now that it's kind of a chicken and egg in a way, a kind of mini egg and a massive chicken, because if you get loads of spectators on the ground, it makes the broadcast look a bit better. It makes it look like a more fleshed out experience for those sitting at home. You start thinking, well, there's loads of people there having fun. It must be great. And then those people think about going to a race or whatever. So it's it, it's all part of the package. But yeah, their their focus will be the broadcast, I think. Yeah, I know. I get it. Like I said, I just feel like it is this I, I think it'll supplement the broadcast a lot. So but we'll get there. Again, patience. We 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 are very guilty in this sport of expecting everything to be perfect immediately. Uh let's give them a chance. Uh we are, you know, what, two weeks away from that first T one hundred race. Let's get, let's not even a week and a, a week and a bit actually isn't week, it? Week week and a couple of days. When mate, this yeah. when this comes out, it's a week and a day, I think. So mm. we should need to take the check check the time zones. Uh, yeah, okay. Anyway, uh, there's been a lot of um, interesting articles about people's opinions of the T100 coming out recently, and the reaction. The, the, I guess the thing you can tell is going to make it something is that the reactions are always strong. So I guess there's plenty of interest in this this series, uh, which is a good thing. Uh, on the T100 series, and this happened since we recorded last time, but we didn't get the chance to discuss it, was the confirmation that the uh, yet-to-be-named California T100 event has, in fact, now been confirmed to be Escape from Alcatraz. The race is happening around the one of the you know the most iconic events in the sport, and I think it's fantastic. Yes, I do as well. It is exactly what we have been saying they should be doing. 
taking exciting, interesting race races in interesting locations with a unique element to them all around the world and bringing them into this series. You know, it's it's the one thing that I think Super League does a brilliant race experience, but the one thing they suffer from a little bit is you could take almost any race environment, you're watching those athletes race and it, you wouldn't, if you removed all context, it, you wouldn't know where they were. Um, having the PTO race, the T100 race in Escape from Alcatraz will be unique, man. It'd be interesting. It'll be jumping into the water at the start of that race and watching people swim for sure. Right? Do, you th- do you think he, piggyback on what we were just discussing it, because, you know, the Escape from Alcatraz course is probably not conducive to a broadcast. It's a point to point swim. You know, they jump off the ferry in the middle of a heart. And then the right, like, isn't part of the runs on the beach as well. Like they run down the stairs through the thing and run along the beach. Do you expect it to be the same course or is it going to be what we were just discussing with, with super Tri, for example, where we're going to see them instead of like, they'll have the escape from Alcatraz event, but then the, the, the PTO, the T100 event will be a different course. I wouldn't be surprised if they adulterated it slightly. Okay. You know, bastardized it slightly and changed it for the pro course. I would obviously I'd keep the age group one, the mm. um the epic race that everyone expects, but I would definitely um I would expect them to alter the pro course slightly to make it a more broadcastable experience, but yeah, I mean I would love to do that race. I've always wanted to do that race. Um it's uh, it's just pre- prohibitively expensive, <laughs> if I'm honest. It is. It got crazy expensive. Uh, but, mm. yeah, like I said, I think it's a good spot for the race. You know, we got two American. We've got a West Coast and East Coast American race. The only one they get to confirm is the grand final, I think, at this point. So we got a pretty good idea of what the T100 schedule is looking like. And I believe – so my head, this is – when is when is the Escape from Akutra's race? Let me check. Uh, I can tell you. Yeah, thanks. Um. Do you remember? 8th to the 9th of June, 2024. Cool. Okay. So, yeah, we, like I said, we've got We're this. We're going to go from Miami regular... to April, Miami to Singapore in April, Alcatraz in June, London in July, Ibiza, September, Las Vegas in October, Dubai in November, and then the grand final, which is TBC. Mm, interesting. Yeah, cool. Well, yeah, Escape from Alcatraz is one of the most iconic triathlon events in the world. Good to see them getting on board with it. Uh, I need to see them add the Alpe d'Huez triathlon into this series at some point. I agree. That would be fucking awesome. It would be so good, actually. It would be so good. And they have to watching imply those pros. And they have race to impl- up that mountain. They introduced the Sam Long rule, which is you have to do it on one bike. <laughs> <laughs> I yeah. still think I still think that's one of my favorite triathlon stories ever. There's yeah. that, and there's the there's the article which was when the pandemic started. And they were talking about how Lionel Sanders reached out to the, was it the bad water or the Western States or one of those, you know, extreme ultra. And they're like, he said he wanted to do it. And they're like, no, mate, you, you'll die. <laughs> <Was that okay? laughs> you'll die. That was another one that tickled my fancy a fair bit. Um, on another note, again, just sort of on the, on the, you know, the, the, the theme of um, racing, the Napier World Cup event was on the, the World Triathlon Series started or World Triathlon season started on the weekend with their world cup events in Napier instead of New Plymouth, it's moved to Napier, which is East coast of uh, this North Island of New Zealand. Uh, I tuned in to watch. I only watched the men's race just because of the timing. Uh, and mate, I was pleasantly surprised by the broadcast. I, I know Were that you now I genuinely was again, not send the world on fire. Right. But compared to last year's new Plymouth event with the shaky cam and everything, I felt this was a, a, a very, reasonably well broadcast triathlon and i thought a huge step forward huge step forward in fact uh to what we've been experiencing from world triathlon in the past and i hope fingers crossed that we are seeing a uh i guess a commitment to improving the broadcast quality this year banging that's what you want to hear isn't it mm. that's what you want to hear we want to see all these new events all these new options raising the quality of everything around it now we don't want it to be a race to the bottom well, let's let's talk about the race. And we, again, I haven't seen the women's race yet. Uh, I know that Sophie Sophie Lynn from Australia won, but I don't have the specifics. Uh, maybe while I'm talking, you could pull up the results of the women's race, mate. That would yeah. be a big help. Uh, but in the men's yeah, race, uh, we had obviously a local favourite Hayden Wild there, and I, I mean, I was joking with Hayden's coach 
uh, in the lead up, just been like, guess what? Hayden's going to win this thing. Like it's not even, a, not even close. Like it's just, it's the Hayden wild show. Uh, but the race probably, uh, he probably didn't do himself any favors when Hayden got out of the water in second last place, 40 seconds, 47 seconds down on the lead. Uh, useless bastard. <laughs> come on, Hados. Uh, but what we then saw was Hayden try to ride his way through the field. He got off the bike, I think off the top of my head, about 28, 29 seconds down from the lead group and then proceeded to run through the entire field and get within five seconds of the leader with about 400 meters to go and to finish up in second place. But it was like the broadcast was really well done, but the actual race was exciting because you had this, this guy leading and Hayden just running him down and, uh, <laughs> and winning by six seconds, mate was no Hayden didn't Hayden came second. Um, yeah, no, that's what yeah, I mean. The guy, yeah. the guy leading, won by six seconds. Ka- 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 Callum, Unreal. Callum McCluskey. McCluskey. Callum McCluskey took it in yeah. first place with Hayden in second, and Alberto Gonzalez Garcia in third place. But yeah, it was uh it was it was a good race to watch. If you guys, unfortunately, you need to have a subscription to watch any of the World Triathlon events, which still fucking baffles me. Uh, but interestingly, Hayden's swim was only. Yeah, come on. Give us the stats. 23 seconds slower than the winners. Yeah, but I think that you winner know. probably, he ran, he took off like the clappers and he was in a group on the bike where Hayden, I think, had to literally ride through everyone. Yeah, yeah, but Hayden's bike was only two seconds slower <clears throat> than the winners. Yeah. So that guy's so in good form. He was, he'd have only started the race 25 sec, twenty the run 25 seconds down. Obviously, that. With a bit of trout, maybe a bit of trout. Actually, Hayden's T1 was quicker than the winners. His T2 was one second down. So he just started the run 26 seconds down, which is, you know, it's not quite as as big a margin as I was expecting. Mm, I think it was, yeah, 26 seconds sounds about right. But like just from like the, I guess, the drama of the event, it was very, very cool to... Uh... Yeah, yeah, I bet that was awesome. Yeah. How about the women's results? Have you got the women's results there? Because I know, that, uh, firstly, Australia, Australia won everything, by the way. Uh, every single race that happened that weekend, Australia won, which is, uh, you love to see it, mate. Actually love yeah, to see so it. Yeah, so Sophie Lynn was first place with Sophie Alden in second from Great Britain and Olivia Mateus in third, also from Great Britain. So two Great British athletes on the podium compared to one Australian. But where was this? Yeah, the Australian oh, won. Yeah, yeah. Uh, winning time is 56.35. Second place, 56.43. Third place, 56.44. Um, I didn't see this race either due to time zones and uh, not really knowing it was on, I suppose, mm. would also be a problem. But yeah. uh, we'll both catch up on that. But yeah, interesting result. And good to see the World Triathlon Series kicking off. And uh, I'm very pleased to hear that the broadcast is an improved. Now, the only thing I want to talk about a little bit about, and it's, it's, I don't think it's drama, but it's certainly something to discuss, is when um, Callum finished the race. So if if you had to, when Hayden Wild finishes a race and he wins, what does Hayden Wild do? What's his what's his signature celebration as he runs down the finish shoot to, to Clem? The Falcon Wings, right? No. Yeah. So Callum McCluskey, who won the race, after he jumped through the finish tape, he then did the mock Falcon Wings, turned around and shushed Hayden Wild. Ha! Huh! <laughs> are they mates i don't think so <laughs> interesting i don't think they're mates if they're, at all. Mates, if they're mates it like, did look friendly. i mean if it was if it was you and i you piss takings allowed isn't it yeah but if it's uh i don't know someone else yeah that's but, uh well, that's what i wanted to talk about do you think it's do you think as a fan is that a bad thing or are oh, you like no, fuck yeah? Bad we need more. That's we need a, a bit. Bad. We need a bit of fucking aggro. We need that's a bit. Not of... a bad thing at all. I mean, look, <clears throat> we don't live in a world that's cuddly, and these these people are at the top of their profession. They are attempting to be the very very best in the world. So a bit of dog eat dog has to be there. A bit of needle has to be there. You have to be willing to, because it also you got to remember it might not work. It might not be to his benefit. He's taking a risk. He's doing something where he's playing a little mind game. And to some athletes, that might log in their psyche and go, like, oh, fucking hell, he beat me. To some other athletes, it might be a fuck, stone cold fuck you. And he might get absolutely steamrolled by Hayden next time oh, because of that moment. Yeah. So it's yeah, yeah it's I interesting. Know. I like it. And it I, creates a, a 3D man. dynamic to it. I really like it. Like it definitely... At first... It's it's funny the evolution of things, right? Because at first you see, and like again, we're mates with Hayden. Like Hayden's a friend of ours, and 
at first I was like, oh, fuck, that's a bit like, come on, mate, it's Hayden. And then I'm like, actually, like Hayden was a bit fired up about it and everything. You're like, I like this. Like, I, I like that there's a bit of stone thrown because like, you're right. We've always sort of said that everybody plays a bit too nice in triathlon and and uh yeah it, I, i'm all for it and you're right it's a risk it's a gamble he could come out looking like an absolute fuckwit if the next time they race hayden beats him by minutes and just waits They're like what i'd i hope and we, we spoke about this with sam long and sam laidlow in uh it was the it was the collins cup that year right where there was all that beef in the lead up to it and then they finished and they hugged and i was like fuck that if i was sam long i would have been standing at the finish line with my watch going What's the gap, motherfucker? Like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> this is pro triathlon, not pro mates. Yeah. Um, so yeah, on... no, I like that. I like that. It's. I mean, it's. If I was Hayden, I wouldn't like it. Yeah. But I'm not. I'm a. I'm a spectator. I'm someone who wants to see the athletes trying to get the very best out of themselves all the time and trying to find ways to get an edge on their competition. As long as it's within the rules, how about it? Well, he's going to be. Are you ready for my segue? So, do you think the reason that we're seeing Hayden? Uh, swim just not being there is because he's so confident that it is not going to be a swim in Paris because recent ah. reports suggest <laughs> that there might not be a swim in the Paris Olympics. Yes, despite the 1.4 billion euros the city of Paris has spent to improve the water quality of the Seine, the water quality is still very poor. The quality is so bad, in fact, the Olympic triathlon is in jeopardy and a plan B needs to be looked at. A plan B that does not exist at the moment. Um, swimming in the Seine has been forbidden since 1923 due to poor water quality. And that is a due to a too high concentration of the E. coli bacteria. Shit. Which is yummy. We love those. <laughs> Absolutely lap those up. So um, they haven't actually managed to get it to meet the European Union's minimum requirements for safe bathing water. Uh, due to heavy rainfall, sewage, and feces that flows directly into the world famous river. So, uh, yeah, it's yum, it's, yum, it's yum, 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 <laughs> yeah, nummy. <laughs> and I mean, there, there's there's you and I lining up to go and race in a water course that directly fed by the Thames. So you know, we might be laughing out the. Uh, is it the same thing faces. there? I mean, the Thames is not great. Yeah, yeah it's not as Yarra. bad as this. So it's not as. But they've made a huge amount of. Um, they've done a huge amount of work in the Thames to improve the water quality of that river. So, do you think this could see the? Do you think they are more likely to cancel the swim or move the race? Move the race. They won't cancel the swim. Okay. It says in the article that some Olympic test events were turned into triathlons due to the poor water quality that prevented swimming. Um, and two weeks before the event, World Triathlon was confident the swim would be possible. Um, but you know turning Olympic test event into triathlon is a different thing to turning the fucking Olympic showpiece triathlon into triathlon. What they'll do is they'll find a different venue. I think I'll fix and it. And it. it'll be gutting because it won't be in Paris. It'll be somewhere else. I think I'll fix it. But yeah, hmm, ooh, debatable. No, I honestly, I, mean, I don't know why. I just have this like, I think, it'll be, I think they'll find a way to, they'll find that patch of water yeah. where the, the water quality is yeah. good enough. They might get like fix it, or they'll just go a bit French on it and turn the hazard warning lights on and just be like, "Yeah, it's très bon." Yeah, I reckon they'll just like get a big truck, dump a heap of water, <laughs> and then measure the water as it's pouring out the back of the truck and go, "Oh, look, see, it's good. See, it's no, no problem. Yeah, fine. <laughs> fine. No drama. How, how no about drama. it? <laughs> yeah. if, you, if, if you die, you die. <laughs> if you die, you die. So yeah, it would be a shame, but <clears throat> for me, I don't see. I don't see the examples of the Olympic test events being turned into duathlons as evidence that they might turn the Olympic main event into, into a duathlon. I don't see that. Hmm. Yeah, well, Hayden, if they did, though. Hayden, mate, sorry. Get yeah. back in that pool. Cam Worth could make a comeback, though, couldn't he? <laughs> it's a short course. Yeah, he could, Why actually. Not? This would be, be the time. He could be in the super domestique for Australia. He can pull Callum McC McCluskey around the course. I'd never heard of Callum <laughs> McCluskey before that. Uh Result in Napier oh, yeah. again. <sighs> Things are looking good for us. Oh, I got Matty Hauser. Sorry, I keep forgetting Matty Hauser. Yeah, he's our he's our golden opportunity. Other than Talisman. that, Talisman. Come on, Hauser. Come on, Australia. Uh, I don't actually care to be honest. It's going to be good to be there. Um, the other thing that is happening this weekend is one of the most iconic Ironman races in the world. Ironman New Zealand is happening in Topo. Lake Topo, Taupo, Topo is the actual correct way to pronounce it. Uh, this was the second Ironman outside of Hawaii. Did you know that, mate? 
This was the second one they ever did. I did not know that. Iron Man New Zealand was the the second Iron Man they announced after the success of the Hawaiian Iron Man all those many, many years ago. Now, I've got the start list here, uh, and there are a few names of note. Now, we'll start with the women's start list, and I'm going to start from the, the I guess, a bit lower. We've got Laura Siddle. Uh, we know Laura quite well. Meredith Kessler, who's done this race like 100 times. Uh, Barbara Riveros, Rebecca Clark, Els Visser, Jocelyn McCauley, Amelia Watkinson doing Iron Man, which is excellent. And the name at the top of the list is one you've probably heard of. It's Chelsea Sedara. Oh, well, there you go. That is interesting, isn't it? So that's the women's. And then on the men's, we have got, again, some pretty impressive names on this list. Simon Cochran. Now, I don't know if we've spoken enough about Simon, but uh, Simon's, a, I, I know Simon quite well. Uh, he won, or he broke the record a few times last year for the Ultraman. He did uh, Ultraman Australia, Ultraman Canada, and then he won Ultraman World Champs as well. Um, so well done, Simon. You're a madman. Uh, we've also got Justin Metzler, the big Mets, uh, Steve McKenna, Braden Curry, and... Kiwi favorite Mike Phillips. It's going to be an interesting race. It's going to be a beautiful race. It's nice to see the uh, the Ironman season starting properly, and it's a, it's a place that I would love to go and race. Look at me, mate, talking about triathlons again. Like I right. want to do them. You got the you right. got the hunger back, mate. Now I got uh, the, the bug. Have you been to Topol before? Are you familiar with the? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I, I lived in New Zealand for a year, many many moons ago. And yes, I've definitely been to Topol and it is stunning. Yeah, it's a it's a wonderful part of the world. It is the same location that the 70.3 World Championships will be uh, in December. I have entered that race. So I will be there. It's again, I've I've done the 70.3 there a few times. I've never been over when the Ironman is on, but like, yeah, it's a, it's an incredible event. Now, in I terms plan of the... to be there next year to support a friend who's doing the Ironman. Excellent. I'll have to duck over as well. In terms of the actual racing, how do you see? Let's talk about the women's race first. Now, Els Visser, uh, who is Dutch but basically spends half a year down under racing in uh, Asia, Australia, and New Zealand. She won. She won. Did she win? Did she win Monaco recently? Was that? I think she won at Monaco recently. God, I say it, and then I'm like, oh, I can't actually remember. Uh, yeah. Uh, no, I don't know. Anyway, Els Visser, who's done very well recently. She did win. She she was first in uh, Wanaka. Rebecca Clark was second. Laura Siddle was third. Thank fuck I got that right. Um, Carl Smith won with Mike Phillips. Jack Moody in third. Uh, Elle's done a lot of stuff down here. Amelia Watkinson, who we know got the T100 wildcard series as well, but Amelia has done a few Ironmans in the past. Uh, Asia Pacific Championships. So to see her doing, again, a Kiwi doing that home Ironman race. Uh, and then obviously Chelsea Sadara, who is one of the best runners in the field. How do you see how do you how do you see the race unfolding for those women? It's hard to tell at this at this start of the season really how things are going to play out. Um, I think Els Visser will come in with her tail up and with some confidence off the back of strong performances of late. And I but I think um, Chelsea Sidara might feel like she wants to lay a marker down early in the season because. Um, I just, I just think that she probably needs something like that. I think looking at it, what because obviously uh, Chelsea and Amelia both have T100 contracts and they're both not racing Miami to do Ironman New Zealand. And I think strategically looking at it, it's 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 actually a pretty good idea, to be honest, mate, because yeah, yeah. I think what we look at the whole sort of scope of the year, athletes are either looking at the T100 series or the Ironman Pro Series. This isn't, a, this isn't an Ironman Pro Series race. So, but you still need to also ratify. To, firstly, Chelsea needs to ratify to for her slot because she's a previous champion. So she needs she just needs to complete. I don't think she's just going to complete. But then Amelia, who I, I'm assuming is looking for that knee slot as well, it's a good way of doing it. Let the, let the let that first group do the T100 race. Have a look at how things are going. Let's do this Ironman race. I mean, it's a good thing if you're trying to do both, which I think most athletes are. I think it's strategically quite good. So. Amelia's there going to try and get the slot. Chelsea's obviously going to try to win probably less less pressure to do so because she just has to finish to ratify. Uh, and she's had yeah, a I few. Mean, yeah. It's a very good position to be in because if your race starts to not go the way you want it to go, you can just take your foot off the gas. Know that you've got that rat ratifying in the bag if as long as you finish. And um, not cruise round, but, you know, not stress about having to get slots. Mm-hmm. I, I think that Elsvis, uh, Chelsea Sadara, and Amelia Watkinson are going to be the podium, unless something significant happens, a mechanical or a, 
a crash or something like that. Uh, in what order? I'm not sure, but I think, I honestly think Amelia is so underrated. Uh, I'm I'm going to pick Amelia. I think Amelia is going to win this thing. I think she's. Then I am going to pick Chelsea. Yeah, I think Amelia is going to do really, really well at um I'm in. Especially, you know, you look at how strong a bike rider she is in preparing for Nice, which is such a bike rider course. Yeah, I think we're going to see. I think we're going to see big things from Amelia in the uh, Iron Distance racing this year. The men's race. Now, we have a bit of a grudge match here because both Braden Curry and Mike Phillips are both going for their third Ironman New Zealand title. And to me, it is a race of those two. It's those two. One of those two is going to win the thing. And again, I'll be honest, Mike Phillips is my client. I'm probably a little bit biased. Uh, but Mike beat Braden last year. Uh, Mike's been doing a few little races. I know that Mike is sort of, I think he's going to aim for the, t uh, the, the Pro Series this year, but it's Ironman New Zealand defending champion. Uh Third place, probably Steve McKenna for me. Or, yeah, but, I mean, what do you think about the men's race? How do you see that unfolding? I think Braden Curry's going to batter him, mate. Brutal. Brutal. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think, look, I mean, as uh, as you say, there will be... He'll feel like he's got a point to prove uh, having been beaten last year. And with both of them trying to go for that third victory, it adds a real a bit of spice into it, a bit mm -hmm. of interest. You know, I I even like the fact that it's the same number they're going for. You know, the one one person's going to walk away the victory of this one and, and have that bragging rights for the next year. I think that the fact that Mike got beat by both Braden and Steve in Cairns last year is also, as you say, sort of puts that fire in the belly. I know this is a race that Mike really really likes to win, and I, like genuinely, I, I'm not. I'm trying to be objective here. I, I think we're going to see Mike. Um, I think Mike's going to do it. Mike's weakness, I say. He's, I guess the, the the slight chink in his arm is that his run isn't. He's going to come back from some serious serious injuries. He's never he's never he's not been able to get quite back to where he was when he was peak run form. But he is one of the best cyclists in the sport. Like if you have to look up the best bike position in the sport, look up a photo of Mike Phillips on his bike, and I reckon you're going to be hard pressed to find a better a better bike position than Mike. Like he's he's a beast on the bike. Even though Carl Smith rode a significant amount of time into him in uh, Wanaka, but uh, I'm, yeah, I think Mike and Braden, and I think those three are really going to sort of do some damage to the rest of the field. And there's going to be some, uh, I mean, there's, who was the other guy? Uh, there's a Dutch guy, uh, Nico something. Why well, can't I remember? Uh, he could be up there too. Uh, Metzler. Great. Yeah. I don't, I don't really see him threatening to Nick Heldorn uh, is the other guy, but yeah, I think we're going to see those three sort of do what they did in Cairns and pull away from the rest and make it a bit of a three Horse battle for the win, but they're, they're, they're my podium. I think Mike will probably get the thing because he wants that Ironman title again. Then I'll, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to copy you on the podium, but I'm going to say Braden's going to win it just to make it a bit different. No, I, I appreciate that. It's uh, Again, I think it shows a good start to the season, right? Where we've got some pretty decent athletes uh, on, on the start list. Now, Speaking of start list, and I know we weren't sure if we were going to do this this week, but I think we should. I think, you know, we want to be, want to be current. We want to make sure that everybody knows about stuff as, as fresh. As, so it just means that this episode is going to come out a little bit later. Uh, you, yeah, yeah. you have been given access to some embargoed information from the T100 yes. series. We know the start lists, the full start lists for the we Miami event. Indeed. So... Earlier today, which is Thursday in the UK, the PTO first announced the women's start list. And then later in the afternoon, they announced the men's start list. Now, as the time of recording, which is Thursday evening for me, Friday morning for you, we won't know the wild cards until 2 p.m. UK time on Friday, which is 1 a.m. Saturday morning, Australian time. Now, we know the wildcard list so because I've been given access to that, so we will be reading it out, but Tim's going to schedule the podcast to come out at five past the hour or whatever it is to match that embargo. Um, so the women's start list is Anne Howe, Lucy Charles Barkley, Kat Matthews, Paula Finley, Daniela Reef, Imogen Simmons, Emma Pallant-Brown, Sky Monch, Tamara Jewett, India Lee, Holly Lawrence, and Lucy Birham. That's 12 athletes, so they've got seven wild cards to make up the uh no eight sorry maths fails me <laughs> eight wild cards to make up the 20 slots uh should we do the wild cards for the women and then do the men's let's do it so the wild cards for the women are lucy buckingham mm -hmm. sarah perez sala mm -hmm. 
Hayley Chura, Jody Stimson, Ooh. Marta Sanchez, Kaidi Kivloja, Dide, sorry, Didi, Defrinks, and Jackie Herring. Interesting. Sarah Prosala is an excellent one. Uh, ah, Jody Stimson is an excellent one as well. Yeah, of I'm course. So up for her being on that list. That's banging. And Lucy Buckingham, because that will add it. Uh, Lucy Buckingham brings a bit of fire to the swim. You're not going to see Lucy Charles Barkley just steaming away from everybody. Sarah Persala. Lucy too. Buckingham could stay with her. Sarah Persala could stay with her. Um, so you've got opportunities there to make that swim a little bit more dynamic rather than a one person show. I'm really, I love the women's start list. I really do. And I'm really happy to read these these wild cards because I think they they add a different dynamic to the race. Let's go through the men's and then we can sort of discuss the, the event a little bit. So who's on the men's start list? Men's start list: Magnus Ditlev, Jason West, Matthias Margier, P- Peter Hamerick, Rudy Berg, Leon Chevalier, Sam Long, Daniel Beckard. I know it's sharp. Bradley <laughs> Weiss, Sam Leto, Clement Mignon, Aaron Royal, David McNamee. Ben Canute, Rico Bogan, Alistair Brownlee, and Javier Gomez. 18 runners. So, no, sorry, 17 runners. So only three wildcasts on the men's. Turns out I can't add up. So on the sorry, men's side... You, the... you mentioned, who's the uh, who's the French athlete who lives in the UK? What was his name? Sorry. Leon yeah. Chevalier. Chevalier. Chevalier, I don't know. Whatever. <laughs> a man that spends a lot of time in France. Anyway, the wild cards for the men are Yuri Kalian, Yuri Kl- Mino Kulin, Yuri Kulin, Kulin, yeah, Kulin, Mino Kulhas, and Gregory Barnaby from Italy. Gregory Barnaby, the Who's most Gregory British Barnaby? name I've ever heard, is from Italy. Never heard of Gregory Barnaby. That's probably never Mino, heard of Gregory him. Barnaby. But then I think I think the the men's wild cards are a little less stimulating on the mind. Than because they've got quite a long and deep start list to begin with, so they didn't need firstly they didn't need as many wild cards, and secondly they'd used up a lot of their key players in that because it's quite a deep start list. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I'm quite keen on it. Well, what I want to do is because obviously you are one of the most excitable and emotive guys on the planet. Like in terms of triathlon, like nobody gets more pumped up and hyped than James Bale. Like just you're a real barometer to me of of how hype something is. So I just want to I just want to walk through this timeline with you, okay? Because uh, again, as I said, I woke up this morning. In fact, the WhatsApp group hasn't stopped while we've been recording. It keeps distracting me. Actually. No, it's still still pinging. Still I, um, pinging. I I woke up this morning. There's a lot of there's a lot of talk about the particularly the women's start list. But I want to go on this journey with you, James. Tell me, mate. You first to get the start. You see the start list. Where's your excitement left? from? From like fascinating all the way through to fuck. Where where were you well, on that first start list? Like it gets announced. I saw the women's saw the women's start list and I was very pleasantly surprised, I would say, to see that come in and see the names on it. I was like, oh, yeah, I'm up for that. That looks that looks really cool. So that's so pretty excited emailed... for you, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I was up there. I emailed the PTO. I emailed um Tom and Anthony at the PTO and said, Look, the curse of the fucking podcast. I've got a feeling now you've started announcing that you're going to be announcing all day and me and Tim are going to record tonight. We're not going to know all the answers. Our podcast is going to come out Friday morning and then we're going to say, oh, we don't know the wild cards. And the next thing you know, the wild cards are out and we're out of date instantly. So I asked them if we could just have that information embargoed until and they said yes. So then I, I suddenly had a deluge of all the information. Mate, I had to go and make a cup of tea. Oh fuck! Okay. That's how excited, that's how excited I was. Oh, shit! <laughs> <laughs> and so it's been quite an interesting afternoon because I think the the women's wild cards really supplement that field nicely. I think the men, like I said a minute ago, the men's wild cards are a little less interesting, but you've got seventeen of the key athletes already racing in that start list. So they don't need that wild card oomph quite as much. Um, he did send me some summaries as well of, uh, what did he say? Obviously, he said, Jody won the Challenge Miami event at the same venue in 2021, beating Lucy Charles Barkley into second place. Marta has been quick out of the blocks already this year, winning the Ironman 70.3 Pucon in Chile, 
in January, and Sarah is to date the only athlete to have led Lucy Charles Barkley out of the water in a middle long distance race at the PTO Asian Open in Singapore last August. So I think that's quite interesting. On the men's side, he said these were the next best three athletes in the PTO World Rankings. Yuri's breakthrough came result came at Clash Miami in 2022 when he finished fourth behind the American trio of Sam Long, Jason West, and Ben Canu. Menno finished 10th at the Ironman 70.3 World Championships in Finland last year, and Gregory finished 9th at the 2023 PTO US Open in Milwaukee. He was also selected for the PTO European Open and IB Club as a late withdrawal due to illness. So like I said, men's wild cards, so no, no, less interesting. We, we, I was going to say, we, get, we went through that journey with you on the women's, Let's do the men's. Like, what was it? So you see that first, the original start list before the wild cards. Oh, no. What I said was oh, I saw the women's start okay. list and then I got all of it in one email okay. and I had to go and make a cup of tea and have a bit of a sit down and have a word with myself. Do you think if the purpose of the wild card system is about, you know, getting interest and and things like that, like, because the, the wild cards to me don't really, I'm not like, fuck yeah. Like, I'm like, the, the start list, incredible. I think we are seeing a, a truly world class field here. Uh, you know, if you if you had like obviously there's a few names we'd like to see on it. I think the 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 the, the Norwegians leave a huge uh, gap. Like it's it, you don't realize how big a presence they are until they're not there. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's the biggest thing for me. But other than that, like Javier Gomez versus yeah. Alistair Brownlee, mate. Look, that, those, those wild that? cards. Those wild cards. The list of the wild cards are sensible additions to the races. But I get what you're saying. What they're not is wild cards that make you go, oh, ho, 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 fuck, that's going to be interesting. Do you know what I mean? Mm. It's not like you you look at the wild cards and think, oh, shit, Blumenfeld's going. Or fucking hell, Frodo's lining up. Or something like that. Something that, or, or some short course athlete that you're like, oh, that's going to be quite exciting to see them line up again. I think. The excitement in this first race is in these 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 main start lists, apart from the women's side, where I, I think they really have um, buttressed the start list quite nicely. Mm. Almost a flying buttress, I would say. What the um, hell is a, what's a flying buttress? <laughs> a flying buttress is a buttress with a hole in it. Is a what? It's a buttress with a hole in it. I don't even know what a buttress See, is to be honest. So. You know, a, a wall. If you build a wall, yes, then a buttress is a is a is a piece of masonry that's a cross section to it that helps hold it up. Okay. Yeah, a flying buttress is exactly that, but it's like an arch. So there's a hole here. There you go. I learned you learned something new. I did not think that today yeah. when I woke up I'd be uh learn. <laughs> I'm surprised. It's funny again. You talk about like looking at things that I didn't realize. Like Sarah Press, other somebody I would have thought would get a PTO contract. To be honest, she's you know. Again, mm. I really like Sarah Pressala. I'm really happy to see you get that wild card. And I think she's she's an athlete who's actually going to make a difference on the race. Some of the others, yeah, it's great that their development, you know, as we've sort of said, the PTO races, sorry, the T100 races or PTO races last year have been a little bit guilty of not showing what's happening further back. I think Sarah Pressala is someone who's going to actually impact the race at the front. So her being there and Lucy Buckingham, as you said, with that swim is going to have a dramatic impact on the actual event. Uh the rest of them, again, fantastic. They're given these opportunities. Uh, I don't expect to see too many of them feature. Uh, I think it was DTD, David Tilby Davis, uh, in our WhatsApp group was saying the strength of field at this Miami race is stronger than the women's world champs was last year. Is that right? Was It, it, was, it was similar. Similar or better. Yeah. Which, which is pretty... And DTD sent me a private message earlier. We'll keep it private. Uh, or... No, no, no. I, no, think no. It's, I think I can share this one. What did he say? Prediction, Gwen Jorgensen gets a wild card. Entire US tri community wets themselves with excitement. I'd love it. So, I, I, I mean, I've said this a lot. I right? would love it as well, yeah. I just, I don't see, a... I think a lot of people seem to be obsessed with Gwen's pursuit of the Olympics. Uh, try 24-7, I know you guys listen. Stop putting out every second articles about Gwen. Um, I don't see her going to the Olympics. I think this would be an, like, I can get her in. Come on, I'd, I'd love to see Gwen Jorgensen doing... Um, Doing the T100 series. So being that we're focused on the women, who's going to win it? Ooh, um, Emma Pallant Brown. Ooh, unique. I'm glad you haven't gone for like the Anne Howe, Lucy Charles Barkley choice. Well, do you know why? There's a reason, and it's something I've actually made sure to bring up because. Hang on, uh, this isn't an educated choice, is it? A little bit. I you do didn't a, just throw I a do dart a, at the wall. No, no, I do a little bit of I do a little bit of research, and it's only because, uh, 
Emma Pallant Brown was in London two weeks ago, last week, two weeks ago with a Joe Skipper and Peter Heimrich for a Hoka event. And as part of that event, they did a 10 kilometer run together. And Emma, yeah, I believe, won Smash the thing. Fest. What did she run? So listen to these statistics. She ran like a 33 35, didn't she, or something? 32 33 to just miss out on the win. So she was second. So, so Sorry, 17th overall. Now, comparing her, listen to this. So comparing the Brit to some of her peers truly underlines the run, her running credentials. For example, Tamara Jewett, who is often seen as the fastest runner in middle distance, has a PB of 33.33. Anne Haug, who is the number one ranked, according to the PTO, has a 10K PB of 33.06, which was in Berlin four years ago. Based on pure run speed alone, it is Emma Pallant Brown is one of the best, if not the best, runners in non-draft triathlon. I think Emma Pallant Brown is going to be very dangerous in this Miami yeah. race. Skipper did all right as well, didn't he? Yeah, he did. 31.33. It's, I know we wanted to run under 31, but again, we've got big, big, bigger things on the on the ticket for Joe this year than than a uh, Peter Homerick, yeah, though. Yeah. Fucking hell, he crushed it. What was he like 30, yeah, he did, yeah, 30, 33 or something? Ridiculous. He's a guy that just has flown under the radar 30, for so 30, long. 30, 28, 30, 28. Fuck, that's fast. Fuck. That's so What's fast. What's your 10k PB in a, in a race? 30, 35, 50 something. Oh, maybe pretty good pretty good maybe Mine's 40 30, dead 36 it's it's either low 36 high 35 i can't remember um fair play i actually think i set my fair fastest play. 10k in a half marathon to be honest <laughs> and i did not negative split that race <laughs> I, went, <laughs> I, went I, know, yeah. um, I i i was gonna i was thinking of picking india lee for this one nah, I, I, that's punchy a, punchy athlete I just think um, looking at the course, the fact that it's that speedway, so it's 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 going to be. I think the race is going to be closer, and the fact that there's so much swim power because India is an exceptional swimmer and extreme. She's a very well-rounded athlete. I just see we're probably going to see a lot of athletes together on that bike, and it's going to come down to a running race. Oh, bless you. Excuse me. Um, Sorry about that. Quite similar to short course racing, and I think that's why that's kind of where my head is at with Emma. Is is you're going to have the athletes like the Cat Matthews and those who are who have a deficiency in the sort of, you know, sorry, like a slight weakness in the swim riding through. So if that race is sort of spread out, she's going to bring a lot of them with them. And I think we're going to see a bigger group at the front. And then, you know, Emma Pallenbrandt, Anne Haug, all of those people will be in that front group. So I think it's going to come down to a run, run race. And yes, Cat Matthews is an exceptional runner, but I, I think like the Anne Haugs, the Tamara Jewetts, the Emma Pallant Browns, uh, that's where it's going to come. In fact, I'd probably put those three as my podium. Anne Haug, Tamara yeah, Anna Haug's got Emma a 10K Brand. of 33.06. Mm. So, I can know. And what she did in Ibiza last year, uh, amazing. Yeah, I'm picking Anna Haug, mate. I'm Ooh. picking Anna Haug. Yeah, Anna, Haug's, go to... Anna Haug's my, my pick for this one. Emma Pallant Brown is my. I mean, yeah, Tamara Really Jewett pushing the boat one. out me, picking the PTO number one to win <laughs> in the first race. Tamara Jewett's also on that new Argon as well now. She's, uh, she's, she's sponsored by Argon this year, and that's a very, very fast bike. So, yeah. I'm very excited about the women's race, actually. Just like talking about it, you realize. Rumor is. Yes. You're one of your favorite podcasts is going to be on an Argon for the I've race heard... weekend at the uh, at the T100. I've heard this rumor, actually. There you go. And I just, but again, it's obvious, mate. Joe Skipper is sponsored by Argon, so it's not that big a, <laughs> not that big a secret, mate. Um, men's race. What do you think about the men's race? Men's race. Yeah. I mean, I think, firstly, I know that, it's 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 more optics than 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 actual like real world excitement. But Javier Brown, Javier Javier Brownley, Javier Gomez and Alistair Brownley Mate. back racing against mm -hmm. each other. Mm -hmm. Chef's kiss, that. so much that. that. Yeah, yeah. I it's, I feel like uh, Javier. We 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 know that he made the change to Dan Plews, and we never really have get, gotten to see truly what that's led to. And look, Javier's getting old. I understand that. I still think he's got some fire in the belly, and, and uh, I I just want to see. I just want to have one year of Javier Gomez racing consistently and actually see what he's capable of because one of the greatest to ever do the sport, truly. And yeah, yeah. Apparently ranked two hundred and sixty-eight. Ooh. Ooh. How do you? I mean, looking at that, looking at that, looking at that men's field, I, I think you're going to see Ali. If Ali's finally fit, he, he wins a thing. But is he? I don't oh. know. Are you willing to say that? That's why I are you a, willing to say that? Big big fat appendix next to that comment. I thought hadn't haven't we both said to each other privately and probably on air 
that we're done with picking that man for I wins because he I didn't just pick, falls I just apart. If he's if he's a hundred percent, which I don't think he is, I never he ne- I just I, ne- I assume he never is anymore. But I still I think he's going to make an impact on the race. I think we're going to see an alley at the front, uh, doing his thing. The the name that that's not on that list that I'm very disappointed, uh, and I I hope I hope it's not that he's still injured. I hope that it is just uh, I'm playing things differently. Is Max Newman? That's the that's mm-hmm. the guy that I was really keen to see uh, do this T100 series and sort of see where he's at. And the fact that he's not on the start list makes me go, oh no! Tell me he's still. You know who I'd like to see perform at this race? Tell me, Backyard. I know you. I think I you picked s- you picked him as your win, right? No, I didn't. That was someone else. Oh, was it? Okay. In the group. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, that wasn't me. I love that Daniel. Was, I, I mean, uh, Daniel's fucking legend, legend of a man. Uh, I only want to see good things for Daniel Beckerger. Martin Van Riel's another one I would have liked to see there. Because uh, again, I think Martin Van Riel is gonna... Jeff Monson. Jeff Monson in our group said if he's 100% healthy, he's my pick for the win. That's Beckerger. Who's your pick? And then? I'd love to see Daniel perform. Um, who's my pick for the yeah. win? <sighs> Interesting. I know mine. I find it very difficult to pick someone like Ditlev for a 100K race. Um, he'll be up there. Despite... I don't think he won't. He'll be up there, yeah, but I just don't I don't see it. Come tempting on, to just pull pull Bogan out of the bag, isn't it? Fucking not a bad shout. Hey, I'm very, it's very interested. Just very interested yeah. to see where Rico is. And again, very well balanced athlete, right? Very good swim bike runner. Yeah, yeah. And, totally. and look, and that's what you need to look at how the race dynamic is going to unfold. It's it's a it's a not a it's a it's a speedway right. It's not like there's climbs or anything. There's some little technical bits. Remember where this is where Lionel crashed last year? He crashed on this course. Yeah. Uh, come on, mate. Come on, mate. Who is it? I'm going. Fuck it. I'm picking back a guard. Come I'm on, going, Daniel. I'm going. Jason West. Yeah. Again, runner makes, race. Makes... I just I just see this being a runner's race. You take out Christian. I think it's I think it's Jason West. To be honest, Jason West. Yeah. Who else is on there? Javier Gomez and yeah, Rico Borgen. That can be on podium. I've just made that up on the fly. I think on his day though, Daniel's got the swim to put enough into someone like Jason to be able to and the run. To oh, not... It's a little you need a lot. You need a lot of time to put into Jason. Like a lot of time to put into Jason Yeah, Westman. I know, yeah. I know. I can't imagine being chased by that fucker. Jesus. Fuck that. No, no, no. And I know that he's yeah. very focused on this event too. He won it last year, I think. He won the Clash Daytona, the Clash Miami race. So, did you see the T100 Instagram story that was blowing up? Yesterday? Janice Jan Jan Fredino. Jan Fredino's ticket to Miami, he's who I would assume is going over for it to do a commentary gig or isn't this some known? sort of punditry gig? I just assumed this was known that he's like the on-ground. Is the microphone guy? I didn't. Commentated. I didn't know that, but I, as soon as I saw that story, I assumed it was something like that. Whereas I've had so many messages from people saying, "Is Jan Fredino racing?" I'm like, oh, I, don't, "I don't think so." I wish. Actually, I'd love yeah. to have a. I'd, I'd love to get Jan back on a pot and have a conversation. Like now that he's retired, his his view of the sport. I think that'd be a fascinating chat. Anyway, mate, we're done. That's it. We're done this Are week. We? We're done. Was that it? Well done. Oof. Thank you very much. Jimbo, if people want to find out more about Talking Triathlon, support us on Patreon, etc., what do they need to do? If you want to support the show, jump on at patreon.com forward slash Talking Triathlon. If you want to follow Tim, he's at T414 on Instagram, and I'm at bail.james85 on Instagram. Find us across all social networks, at Talking Triathlon on Insta, and at Talk Triathlon on Twitter. You can join the Patreon group, which gets you access to the monthly bonus episode, which we're about to record, the social group, the WhatsApp group. The WhatsApp group is brilliant. It is teeming with information and fun and piss-taking and opinions, and I love it. It's Perfect. friendly, man. It's a friendly environment. It ain't. It, it's not the Wild West like some of these, what used to be Twitter is and stuff like that. I know. Uh, well, anyway, mate, we are going to go and record our bonus show this week. Hold. I think if we're both going to race the T100 London, we should do like some sort of get together. Yeah, we should for definitely. That's, yeah, I like that idea. There. Well, again, we'll, we can. Yeah, let's 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 make that happen. That's a good idea, actually. Yeah, we'll, yeah. we'll work something out. Like uh, whoever's whoever's part of the Patreon group and is happens to be either there watching or racing, will do some sort of social around that race. Yeah, I like that idea. We get some of the guys there. I know that uh, we'll get some athletes there and stuff as well. So it'd be cool. Um, yeah, as I said, we're gonna we're gonna do a, a bonus episode. So if you guys want to hear that, uh, patreon.com forward slash talking triathlon. Jimbo, talk to you next week. Cheerio.